We're going to be in John 6 this morning as we continue the Belief Project, so if you have a Bible, go there. Um, you're going to understand this morning why we like to systematically teach through Scripture and focus our attention on the Bible. It often points us in a direction of some very difficult things that are in the Bible that we get to kind of process and talk through that we can't always completely understand, but we uh, do our best to try to wrap our minds around. And this passage this morning is a prime example of that. Uh, some of the most controversial words of Jesus are found in the passage we're going to cover this week and next week, and then the uh, following week we'll wrap up chapter 6, so make sure that you are here. Uh, we are in the Belief Project, which is a journey through John's gospel. We jump out of the Belief Project every once in a while and do other series and then jump back into it. So it's kind of a long process for us. But we have made it to chapter 6. And before we take another break, we're going to make it to the end of chapter 6. Does anyone know what it means to tantalize someone? If you don't know what tantalize means, that means that you uh, basically aggravate someone to death, right? Uh, you torment them. You tease them with something that is unobtainable. Now, this word tantalize comes from a story in Greek mythology of a bad guy named Tantalus who was ultimately punished in the underworld in Greek mythology by being chained in a lake in a pool of water. Overhead of Tantalus was luscious fruit that every time he reached out to it, it withdrew from him. And underneath him was fresh, clear, refreshing water. And every time the Tantalus would try to bend down to get a drink of water, it receded away from him. And so he was stuck in this perpetual state of being tormented and tortured by something that was unattainable. And that's where we get our English word tantalized from, is the story of Tantalus, searching and seeking for something that you cannot find, that you cannot obtain. You ever lost something and it bugged you to death that you could not find it? You knew that you had it. You don't know where it went, but it bothers you even to this day when I talk about it, you can't find it. Uh, my mother-in-law is a gift giver, one of her um, gifts in life is she loves to give gifts and get gifts. And she's a little bit of a unique gift giver. And so sometimes when you get a gift, you scratch your head and like, okay, wow, thank you for that. Other times she gives gifts, you're like, wow, this is awesome. Uh, one thing that she gets me fairly regularly are nice pens. I do a lot of traveling and working. I like to have a nice pen to write with. I still do a lot of handwriting stuff. And uh, she gave me a really nice pen. Um, a, a year ago, Christmas, she's given me two of them, actually, and one of them I lost, my favorite of the two I lost, and I have no idea where it is, and it bugs me. Whenever I'm traveling or I'm looking to use a nice pen to write something, I always think about where is that pen, and I know I'll probably find it at some point unless I left it on the road somewhere, uh, but I lost it, and I cannot find it. I have sought for it, I'm seeking it, and I'm being tormented by the idea it's unobtainable in my search. I want to jump back into our text in John chapter 6. Let me read some verses as we get into our study today to set this up. Uh, John 6, 22. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Interesting phrase. The crowds came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Now, why are they looking for him? Is he lost? Like, I know he was here somewhere. Where is this Jesus? Is Jesus lost? Is Jesus hiding? Maybe they thought it was a game of hide and seek, and they have to go across the lake to find Jesus. Is he lost? Is he hiding? No. They were looking, they were seeking Jesus because of what they were seeking for in life. Don't miss this. They were seeking Jesus 
because of what they were seeking for in life. Very thought-provoking question for us today. What are we seeking for in life? More specifically, what are we seeking for in Jesus? What are we looking for? What are we searching for? Why are we seeking after Jesus? Now, if we ask the question, what are we searching for in life? There's some very generic answers that almost everyone will give. You say, hey, what do you want to obtain in life? What are you seeking in life? The most common one by by any stretch of the imagination, the most common one is, I just want to be what? Happy. I just want to be happy in life. I'm seeking for happiness or I'm seeking for contentment or I'm seeking for fulfillment or I'm seeking for love. Or one, one common thing you'll hear in our culture today is we're just seeking peace. As long as you agree with me and hold the views that I hold, we're seeking peace. We're just seeking love, peace, satisfaction, contentment. Now, I could give you the easy preacher response today, couldn't I? Now, whatever you're searching for, whatever you're seeking for, those things can be found only in Jesus. Seek Jesus. Like, I could give you the the easy, cheesy, cliche preacher answer, but I want to take it a little deeper because I think that this story, the idea of seeking Jesus, and it's true that seeking Jesus will bring you contentment and fulfillment, but I think through this story there's something deeper going on, that we have to look at the whole story of what's happening in John 6 to truly understand that. So let me just give a quick recap, bring us up to speed. Uh, Jesus has fed multitudes of people, thousands of people with his miracle of taking a young boy's lunch and transforming it into an all-you-can-eat buffet. And the crowd says, man, we want more of that. We're all about that. They try to force Jesus to be king. We're going to make him our king. Jesus says, I don't want anything to do with that. I'm not here to be your king. He dismisses the crowd. He retreats into the mountains to pray. And he sends his disciples in a boat to cross the sea. As Jesus is praying, as he's retreated to pray, the disciples are out battling the stormy sea. We saw that story last Sunday. Uh, Jesus decides he's going to join the disciples, so he takes a shortcut. He walks on the water um, out to where the disciples are because he can take that shortcut, so why not? And so out he goes into the angry sea, meets the disciples there who are struggling in the storm, gets in the boat with them, calms it all down, and immediately they are at the opposite side. They have reached their destination. Meanwhile, back at all-you-can-eat buffet land, the determined, don't miss this, religious crowd, these are religious people, this determined religious crowd searches for Jesus. They search for him and realize he's got to be on the other side of the lake. And so their search is so desperate that they get in boats and they Cross the lake looking for Jesus. Now, let's be honest. It's a little kind of fatal attraction-y at this moment, right? We're going to find Jesus. He's went in the mountains, but boats are here, and Jesus has got to be somewhere. He's on the other side. Now, remember, these people have come. These are tens of thousands of people who have come out of small villages. They're miles and miles and miles away from home. They've tried to force Jesus to become king. Jesus has said, I don't want anything to do with it. Go home. Go home. I'm going to retreat and pray. Where's Jesus? we got to find Jesus. And so they cross the lake looking for Jesus. Look what they say in verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? The math doesn't make sense, Jesus. We counted the boats. You put your disciples in one boat and sent them away. There's only one missing boat. Jesus, how did you come here? When did you come here? Disciples, boat, Jesus, no other missing boats. Jesus, how did you get to this side of the lake? When did you come here? Now, John chapter 6, at this point in the gospel, this is a watershed moment in the gospel story. You see, the crowd, the religious crowd, had an agenda, didn't they? They wanted their bellies filled. 
They wanted to make Jesus king. But from this moment forward in John's gospel, Jesus loses his popularity. And we'll see why. This passage is often called the bread of life teaching, the bread of life discourse, where Jesus teaches about the fact that he is the bread of life. And as we read through the bread of life discourse, as we study it, it confused, it baffled, it infuriated the crowd that heard it, and it does the same thing today. As a matter of fact, most of these people who profess to be followers of Jesus walked away from Jesus because of his teachings in this passage. And if we're being really brutally honest today, the words of Jesus in this passage create the same response. Many walk away. Many walk away because of what Jesus teaches in this passage. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to listen to these controversial words of Jesus and his very definitive call to believe in who he is found in these verses. Now, I love what Jesus does here when they come and they say, Jesus, when did you get here? When did you arrive? Look what Jesus says in 26. Jesus answered them. Well, kind of. He didn't really answer them but he gives them an answer. He doesn't answer the question, but he gives them an answer. Verse 26, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, and we've said that phrase, truly, truly is a point of emphasis. Like Jesus says, you really need to listen up here. What I'm about to tell you, are you focused on me? Eye contact. Are you listening to me? I'm not speaking as a parent here. Are you you really listening? Are you hearing what I'm about? Put your phone down. Listen to me. Do you hear me? Truly, truly. I'm going to start using that around the house. Walk in Zach's room. Truly, truly, I say to you, this room is a disaster. That's what I said to Reagan yesterday. Truly, truly, if you want a new car, you better keep your current one clean. Truly, truly, Jesus says, Verse 26, again, let's go back. I got lost in truly, truly. Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Jesus does not even answer their question. Jesus, how did you get over here? Now, Jesus could have said, oh, I took a stroll on the sea. I walked on the water and crossed. Jesus doesn't even bring up the miracle. They don't even know. Jesus walked on the water because that wasn't the point. Instead, Jesus goes for the jugular. He goes after their motive. Jesus says, your only concern are full bellies and met needs. You're only concerned. You're only seeking me because I filled your belly. I met your needs. Jesus says, you missed the purpose of the signs. Signs in John's gospel are the miracles, but signs point to something else. And Jesus says, you have gotten so focused on the sign, you've gotten so focused on your own agenda that you have missed the true purpose. Same thing happens to us with modern signs. Anyone ever been driving over to or Chattanooga and saw these signs? See Ruby and her falls. See Ruby Falls. How many See Ruby Falls signs are there? More than we can count? How many of you have actually have seen Ruby Falls? It's really cool if you haven't seen it. How many of you have seen See Ruby Falls signs? How many of you have seen lots of See Ruby Falls signs? How many of you have seen so many See Ruby Falls signs that you wish there were not so many See Ruby Falls signs? That's me, right? Like driving Chattanooga. We get it. See Ruby Falls almost to the point like you don't want to see Ruby Falls because there's so many signs telling you, see Ruby Falls. Now, Ruby Falls is beautiful. You should go see it, experience it, cool story behind it, all that stuff. And if you just focus on the signs, you miss the actual event, seeing Ruby Falls, which is a magnificent waterfall hundreds of feet underground that some dude found exploring like literally crawling in a hole two feet big until he got back to where the waterfall is. Crazy stuff, right? And so it's a beautiful event, 
But you can get so focused on the signs that you miss the point of the signs, which is Ruby Falls. Same thing happens if you're traveling up I-85, headed from the south up through the Carolinas. In between North and South Carolina, there's a place called South of the Border. And they start signs. Anybody ever been to South of the Border or seen South of the Border? You have to be traveling a specific road to see it. I grew up in that area, so I've seen these signs. More signs than Ruby Falls signs are South of the Border signs. Now, they at least try to make them a little funny, like you never saw such a place. You're always a wiener at Pedro's South of the Border. Hundreds of South of the Border signs. By the time you get to it, you realize it's kind of a gas station on steroids. That's about it. You can get just that kind of food or whatever. And, and so, again, so many signs that you really don't want to experience the event by the time you get to it, kind of what the crowds are doing. They're so focused on the miracles that they have missed the point of the signs. They are focused on their own agenda. And the signs can distract from the actual wonder itself, which in this case is Jesus. So they are seeking Jesus for the wrong reason. Does that ever happen? Seeking Jesus for the wrong reason. Oh, they're all about the material provision that Jesus has provided. They are all about the bread, the ongoing bread. They are all about making Jesus king. They are all about Jesus healing their sick. They are all about Jesus providing for their needs. They want to call on Jesus like Aladdin's genie, right? They want to rub the magic bottle. They want the Robin Williams blue genie to pop out and meet their needs and have a little song and dance in the process. They're all about calling on Jesus to meet their needs, rubbing the magic lamp, Jesus being there when they want him to be there, meeting their needs. What does Jesus have to offer me? What can Jesus provide? Now, this is religious people talking. What's in it for me, Jesus? Some met needs, some resume fodder, I'm a Christian, some marital advice. Man, we, we call on Jesus a lot of different times, don't we? We need our needs met. Well, what's in it for me, the wrong reason? I've got a crisis in my life. I need some relief. I need a fix for my guilt. I need a fix for my shame. I need a fix for my sin. I'm going to seek Jesus. Now, let me tell you, if that's you today, Jesus will meet you where you are. Wrong motives, wrong reasons, he'll meet you where you are. But I'm afraid a lot of times as religious people, we're seeking Jesus for all the wrong reasons. What's in it for me? How does Jesus fit my agenda? When I need him, I'm going to call on him. Otherwise, Jesus, back in your bottle and put the golden genie lamp back on the shelf. And when, and when I need it again, then, Jesus, I need my fix. Got some guilt going on. Got some shame. And a lot of times we're just like the religious crowd of Jesus' day. Look, what Jesus, look how Jesus responds to this, verse 27. Jesus says, Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Jesus says, stop working for food that rots and spoils and pursue the eternal bread, which, by the way, Jesus says, this eternal bread is not earned, it's given. It's given by the one upon, God, upon whom God has set his seal. Now, we know what a seal is. A seal is a... a the identification mark. It's an authenticity mark. It represents authority. If I buy a, an Apple product, which why would you buy any other product? But if I buy an Apple product and open it up, there's a seal of authenticity. This product was produced by Apple. Authenticity, right? A seal of authenticity. Jesus says, I am the one upon whom God has set his seal of authenticity, of authority. Jesus has rights because of who he is. 
He is the one upon whom God has set his seal. So Jesus says, stop working for food that rots and spoils and pursue eternal life, which, by the way, is given by the one upon whom God has set his seal. Look at the crowd's response, verse 28. They said to him, what must we, what's that next word, do to be doing the works of God? Crowd says, Jesus, we're in. Eternal bread sounds awesome. What do I do? How do I earn it? Seeking eternal life, not just for the wrong reason, but through the wrong route. We want to earn our way. Did you know this question that the crowd asks is one of the most natural questions? reactionary questions that we give as humans when it comes to these matters of eternal life. What must I do? Like it's not, it's not the only place in the Scripture that we find this question to Jesus, right? What must I do? What do I do? How do I earn it? How do I obtain it? What do I have to do? What effort do I have to make? These are religious people And just like in our tendency today as religious people is our religion can be very misguided. What must I do? What effort do I have to take? How do I earn God's favor? How do I be good enough for God if I stop doing these things and start doing these things? Does that mean that I, I will earn God's favor? It's misguided religion, and it's a complete misunderstanding of the gospel because the gospel is not about how good you are. The gospel is about how good Jesus is. The gospel is the opposite. As you've heard me say before, the gospel actually is not about how good you are. The gospel is about how bad you are, that we are sinners in need of Jesus, that it's about how good Jesus is. There is nothing you can do to earn it. There is nothing that you can do to earn God's favor, to earn the righteousness of Jesus, to make yourself acceptable in God's sight. And just like this religious crowd, our tendency is to say, that sounds awesome. Now, Jesus, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? Look at Jesus' response. Jesus answered them, This is the work of who? Of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Jesus, what do we have to do? Jesus says, one, cut back on the stalking. It's getting a little aggressive. Um, That's not in the text. Um, (laughs) Two, believe in the one sent by God. Jesus says it's not earnable. It's not obtainable through your good works. You believe and you have life, which is John's gospel, the whole theme of it. Believe. Those that believe have life. By the way, Jesus says, this life is a work of God. It's the Nicodemus remix. We're right back to John 3 when Nicodemus, the religious leader, says, what do I have to do? How do I earn this? And Jesus says it's a supernatural work of God. It's God at work. Believe in him whom God has sent. 30, 31. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. The crowd says, Jesus, that's awesome. Can we see your credentials? Can we check out your resume? Prove yourself to us. After all, our boy Moses, maybe you've heard of him, Jesus. Our boy Moses, our fathers, Moses provided them heavenly bread every day for like 40 years to thousands if not millions of people. I mean, the the whole like taking a boy's lunch and multiplying it to 10,000 people, like that's a okay, Jesus. That's two thumbs up, emoji style. But our boy Moses, our boy Moses fed hundreds of thousands of people every day for 40 years. What you got, Jesus? What have you done lately for me, Jesus? 
What's up your sleeve? Seems like Moses has got a one-up on you. Jesus, 32. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, keep your room clean. I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus responds, you missed the point about Moses. You want to talk about Moses? Let's talk about Moses. Truly, truly, I'll tell you what Moses was all about. One, Jesus says, Moses did not give the bread. God gave the bread. You're so focused on the gift, you have missed the giver. Same thing that happens to us. We get so focused on the gift that we neglect the giver of the gift. Look at all the blessings in my life. Look what God has given me. All of those are signs to point us to the Father. And we can become dependent upon the gift and neglect the giver of the gift. Moses didn't give the bread. Jesus said God gave the bread. By the way, manna is not true bread. Guess what? Every day they had to get up and gather the manna. Why? Because after you eat manna, you get hungry again. That's kind of our reality of life, right? No matter how much we eat, buffet style at the Golden Corral, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, we still get hungry again. I love sushi. I told you, sushi's awesome, but 30 minutes after you eat like the ocean, you're hungry again. We get hungry again. Jesus says manna is not the point. You eat manna, you're going to get hungry again. It's not the true bread. Man is the means. It's not the end. He also says, look, you want to talk about Moses? The bread of life is not physical bread. The bread of life is an eternal life source. It's deeper than the manna. It's deeper than the multiplied lunch. And then he, he love throws this right in at the end. By the way, the bread of life is not just for you Jewish people who are here. It's for all the world, Jew and Gentile alike, not just Israel. Did you notice what they said? Jesus, are you familiar with our boy Moses, our fathers? We're the special chosen people of God. You should do this for us, Jesus. Look who we are. We are Israel. We are God's chosen people. Jesus says, you missed the point of Moses. It wasn't about the bread. It was about the God of the bread. It wasn't about the manna because manna is fleeting. It's temporary. It was pointing to something greater. It's not about um, getting, getting filled in your physical stomachs. And by the way, the true bread is not just for Israelites. The true bread, Jesus says, is for all people. It's for the entire world. 34, they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Smart people. Crowd says, Jesus, we are in. We love the idea of free special bread. Give us seconds. Continually feed us. Feed us always. We love free bread. Anybody like free bread? Does anyone eat at certain restaurants just because of the bread they serve? Like you get the basket of yeast rolls. Who serves the yeast rolls around here? Like those kind of fake steakhouses like Texas Roadhouse and Logan's. They serve, like, they get you on the bread, not the quality of the steak, right? So, like, free yeast rolls. You can't beat free yeast rolls. I love bread. Bread is the staple of life throughout the world, literally. It's not the most healthiest choice all the time to eat, but I love some awesome, good bread. I love the yeast rolls. I like the brown and serve. Anybody else up for the brown and serve rolls? Man, pop those suckers in. Awesome bread choices. When I was a kid, I used to take my Wonder Bread, even though my parents were very frugal, so it probably wasn't Wonder Bread. It was probably some generic bag that just had the word bread on top, and it was probably misspelled like B-R-E-D or something. And so 
I would love to take that bread. Anybody else with me on that? I tell my kids, like, you don't know what generic is. Generic's like when my mom walked down the aisle, there's these giant white boxes of cereal on the bottom shelf that just took whatever name brand and flipped them. Like, instead of Rice Krispies, like crispy rice, right? Instead of corn flakes, flakes of corn. And it was just white bag or just maybe a bag at times. So anyways, that's a whole different thing that's built up inside of me as a kid. So that's why my kids don't have to eat that generic stuff because I had to suffer through it. Uh, but anyways, I used to take that generic bread straight out of the loaf, and for some reason when I was a kid, it tasted better if you wadded it up. <laughs> Are you with me on this? Wadded up bread. There's a restaurant that now is a chain of restaurants, one that's very popular down uh, near the Gulf Shores area called Lambert's. Anybody ever eaten at Lambert's Cafe? Well, if you want more bread, what do you do? Hold your hand up, and they'll throw a roll at your head, like from across the restaurant. You better duck. Someone's going to get hit by a roll. Lambert's Cafe, more rolls, they will throw them to you, unlimited rolls. When my daughter, who's now 20, Kaylee was just a small toddler girl. We were at Lambert's Cafe, and she would hold her and stand up in the little booth and hold her little hand up, more bread, please. And they'd throw a roll, and she'd take the roll and put it on Daddy's plate. More bread, please. I'll throw it to him. Lambert's Cafe, unlimited throwed rolls. Is that even a word? Throwed rolls. Keep it coming. Give us this bread always. We're in. We're all about the free special bread, Jesus. More rolls, please. Give it to us. 35. How does Jesus respond to this? Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus gets very clear, kind of, <laughs> with the crowd. I am the bread of life. Seven times in John's gospel, Jesus makes an I am statement with a qualifier. I am, in this case, the bread of life. Of life. Jesus says, This bread that we are discussing, this heavenly bread that has come down, Jesus says, This bread, it is me. It is I. I am the bread. I am the bread of life. And whoever comes to me, never gets hungry, never gets thirsty. What a promise. Jesus says, come to me and you will never grow hungry again. I provide eternal satisfaction. And let me be clear today. This is why at City Church, it's why we point people to Jesus, to Jesus, 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 Jesus. We don't point them to church. We don't point them to styles. We don't point them to cool lights. We don't point them to whatever it is that we do to try to make the church cool. We point them to Jesus, 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 because it is Jesus and Jesus alone that brings eternal satisfaction to hungry souls. I can't satisfy your hunger. I can't preach hard enough and teach long enough to satisfy your hunger, but Jesus can. It's why you're going to hear me talk about Jesus, 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 week in and week out, because He and He alone is the bread of life. He and He alone brings satisfaction and fulfillment to the hungry, thirsty soul. Now, I'm not sure that we really get the depth of what Jesus is saying here. What Jesus is saying is, I am the only true source of satisfaction. Jesus says, I am what you're looking for. You too saying it, right? Still haven't found what I'm looking for. Jesus says, I am what you are looking for. That longing that craving, that deep-seated desire in your heart and soul to be loved, to be known, to be understood, to be fulfilled, to be satisfied, to be joyous, that deep-seated desire, it can only be fulfilled in Jesus. Man, our hearts, as we say, they're idol factories. 
Man, we know how to pump out some idols. We know how to pump out some stuff that we're turning to and we're looking for and we're searching in to find fulfillment. We know how to manufacture some idols. We know how to put things out there to say, well, that's going to bring me happiness or that's going to bring me fulfillment. Or if I only had that, or if I was only in this relationship, or if I had this person in my life, or if this relationship was mended, we know how to pump out some idols. And Jesus says, in the midst of that idol factory, what I want you to know is the only thing that's going to bring you fulfillment and satisfaction is Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus is more than enough to fill your hunger, to satisfy your thirst. 36 is such a sad verse. Jesus says to religious people, but I say to you, You have seen me and yet do not believe. These are religious people. These are people looking for Jesus, searching for Jesus, seeking after Jesus. And Jesus says to them, you have seen me and yet you do not believe. In your search for life, in your search for meaning, in your search for significance, in your search to have your physical needs met, Jesus says you have missed the point. You have substituted the earthly. You have substituted something as cheap as bread for the eternal. You've tried to satisfy the eternal with your temporary fixes. Now, before we point the finger at the crowd and say how foolish you were to be focused on a boy's lunch instead of the bread of life, don't we do the same thing every single day of life? As Jesus says, believe in me, I am more than enough, Devin. I can satisfy your needs. I can fill your thirsty heart. Jesus says to me, Devin, come to me. And I say, Jesus, that's awesome, but what about this? My eye gets caught by the glistening and the glamorous and the idols that my own heart manufactures. And Jesus says to me, you see me, but you do not believe in me. But don't worry, Jesus says, 37. Jesus says, I'm not a failure. Look at 37. All that the Father gives me, they will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Jesus says, don't don't be deceived. People walking away from me in unbelief, I'm not a failure. And here's why. The inability of people to see and believe does not mean that Jesus has failed. Jesus is clear. Salvation is from God. It's ultimately from God. Jesus says all those who have been chosen by God, they will come. And whoever comes will not be kicked out. They will not be cast out. This little verse and several other verses with it um, are part of, make up part of what we call in the Bible, very scary word for us, the doctrine of election. Now, anytime you see that word, we get kind of afraid of it, like, you know, God's putting people in, putting people out, kicking and screaming, don't want to go, don't want to come, but God's deciding, just handpicking and selecting people. Like that's our view of election. That's not election uh, in the Bible. But Jesus says here that God in his sovereign plan guarantees that there are those who are chosen and that they will be called and that they will come and remain. Listen, this is not a doctrine to be afraid of. This is a doctrine that guarantees our salvation. That from beginning to end, salvation is a God thing. That God enables us to come to him. And those who come to him will persevere to the end. This is good news. Jesus says, those that come to me, those that God has given me, they will come. And those who come will not be cast out. I love that. Those who come to me, Jesus said, they're not getting kicked out. You ever feel like you do things that should probably get the boot? Jesus said, those who come to me, they will not be kicked out. They will not be marginalized. They will not be ostracized. They will not be victimized. They will not be abused. Those that come to me, no one will be cast out. Look where he grounds this promise. 38, 
For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Check this out. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but I will raise it up on the last day. Jesus says, I came to do the will of the Father. What is the will of the Father for Jesus? Jesus says the will of the Father is to secure the eternal salvation of those that God has called. He says, I'm going to raise them up on the last day. It's a guarantee. Listen to me. If you are in Jesus, our salvation is as secure as the relationship between the Son and the Father. As much as Jesus is secure in his heavenly Father, so we are secure in him. Is that a promise you can roll with? That there is no way for me to be cast out, that my salvation is guaranteed in him. You know why? Because it's not about me. Jesus says, I do not lose anyone. I'm not searching and looking, thinking, well, where'd my kids go? Ever been in that moment as a parent? He's like, right here, and now he's like, not not here. Happened to me. I think I've told this story before. Disneyland. Hello. Like, Zach, if you're going to choose a place to get lost, let's not roll with Disney. It's like lots of people there. Come off a ride. Zach and his other buddy, about four or five years old at the time. Where's Zach? Where's Mark? I don't know. They were right here. Frantic search ensues after about five or ten minutes. It's time for the, ba- the, the giant marching parade to come down the middle of downtown Disney. I'm like, dude, if this parade happens, we're toast because, like, lots of people come to see the parade until I look at the upcoming parade, and there's Zach and Mark leading the parade. Marching in front of the headmaster. You ever lost someone? Jesus says... Those that come to me, the ones the Father has given me, I'll raise them up on the last day. I'm not going to kick them out. I'm not going to lose them, no matter how ugly it gets, no matter how far they stray, no matter how far they run, no matter how many times they disappoint in their minds, no matter the sins they commit, I will raise them up on the last day. I will not lose them. We're going to end with 40 today and then pick back up next week. Here's the balance of all this. This is the will of the Father. He goes back, will the Father for Jesus to secure the salvation of those who come. This is the will of my Father. Listen, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. What is the will of the Father for us? We see what it is for Jesus, secure the salvation of those that God has called. What is the will of the Father for us? The will of the Father for us is look on Jesus and believe. Look on Jesus and believe. And Jesus says, those who believe are granted and guaranteed eternal life. You're not getting rejected. You're not getting the boot. The Bible teaches we are called to come, to see, to believe, that those God calls are those who come, those who see, those who believe. There's this kind of tension in Scripture, this dynamic in Scripture of divine sovereignty on one side and human freedom, human responsibility on the other. We see it in this text so clearly that Jesus says, my father calls and those who call, whom my father calls, they will come. By the way, come. Divine sovereignty, human responsibility. God calls, we respond. The Bible teaches both. So we embrace both. We're not afraid of them. We embrace them. They're not contradictory. They're complementary. My favorite dead preacher Spurgeon says, friends do not need to be reconciled when it comes to sovereignty and freedom. They don't need to be reconciled. They work together. Somehow in God's plan, they work together. Here's the bottom line when it comes to this issue. We are naturally depraved sinners. We're sinners. We are naturally depraved sinners and cannot come to God on our own terms, our own merit, our own efforts. Yet, God, Paul says, in his rich mercy, in his rich grace, draws sinners to himself. He enables our willingness 
to come. And as a result, we freely choose to believe in Jesus, come to Jesus, who secures and perseveres, who secures and provides eternal life for those who come. Don't miss the point of election, the doctrine of election. The doctrine of election is not a source of controversy. It's a source of comfort. Jesus is the source of our security. My salvation hinges on Jesus, not on me. I don't know about you, but that's good news for me. If it's up to me, it's if up to my efforts and my works and my being good enough and me somehow kind of one-upping the guy beside me, if it's up to me, then I'm going to fail. But it's not up to me. It's up to Jesus who has secured my salvation, who has guaranteed my eternal life. Don't get lost in the controversy. Find comfort in the grace. You see, here's what election is not. Election is not me realizing somehow that my name is on a list of God-chosen people and I'm pulled to Jesus kicking and screaming against my will. That's not election. Election is not people saying, I want to come to God, but I can't. I'm not on the list. Don't be afraid of doctrine that we don't quite grasp. I don't get all this. I get that somehow these two worlds, God's sovereignty and human freedom, somehow God marries those things together, and it's mysterious, and I don't get it all. I don't know where his sovereignty and my freedom come together, but I know that they do because the Bible teaches both. So what I do is I embrace it and I celebrate it. I'm one of his. And we can get so distracted trying to figure out the mysterious that we miss the point of Jesus' words. Guess what? 2,000 years we've been talking about this. We haven't quite figured it out. One day, we'll understand clearly. Until then, we teach what the Bible teaches. So when we get to John 6 and it says, the Father calls and those that the Father calls come. You know what we're going to teach? The Father calls. When the Father says those that come, come, they come. Two verses later, Jesus says, whoever believes and comes are mine. You know what we're going to teach when we get to that verse? Whoever believes, come. Somehow those two worlds come together. We're going to teach what the Bible teaches, and it teaches both. But let's not get focused on the mysterious nature of what Jesus is saying here, because if we do, guess what? We become the crowd. It's exactly what happened to them. They got so confused by the words of Jesus that they walked away in unbelief. What is the main emphasis of this text? What is the point of Jesus in John 6? The emphasis of this text is Jesus is the bread of life who brings eternal satisfaction to those who embrace him by faith. He is our sustenance. He is what sustains us. He is the reason for our existence. Come to him. And those who come, he will not kick you out. That's why I say to you, if you're a Jesus follower today, this gospel message is for us every single day. Hear me clearly, follower of Jesus. You are secure in Him. You are secure in Jesus. You are secure. In Jesus. And this security gives us assurance. It gives us hope. It gives us confidence. It gives us fulfillment. It gives us satisfaction. I am His. Whatever happens, I am His. Whatever season of life I'm going through, I am His. No matter what trials life is throwing my way, I am His. When I don't understand it all, I am His. When I don't get it all, I am His. When my relationships are strained, I am His. When I'm battling the same temptation again and again, I am His. When I fall prey to sin again, I am His. I am His. There is security in knowing who you are in Jesus. And we live out of that security. 
that he is our confidence. He is our hope. He is our security. He is our assurance. He is our victory. I belong to him. Where are you seeking today to bring you what only Jesus brings you? Upon what are you leaning to bring you only what Jesus freely offers? In whom are you seeking to bring you only what Jesus freely offers? We're seekers, aren't we? We are prone to seek. We are prone to look. And we are prone to look in all the wrong places. And the gospel says, not only are you a seeker, but God, from the opening pages of the Bible, is a seeker. God is a seeker who invites us seekers to come and find in Jesus what we are seeking. And the gospel says, Jesus provides nourishment to the seeker, fulfillment to the seeker. That Jesus is God's approved, sealed means of provision of nourishment. Think about this claim and we're done. Jesus claims to us that he will eternally sustain me and satisfy me. I am the bread of life, Jesus says. Hungry person looking for nourishment, come to me and you'll never be hungry again. Thirsty person seeking spiritual nutrition, fulfillment, satisfaction, come to me and you will never thirst again. Person that's here today who has not believed in Jesus, come to him. Come to him. Come and believe in Jesus. Jesus follower, come to him. Come and believe in Jesus. I am his. Are you a follower of Jesus today? Say that with me. Say, I am his. Let's say it together. I am his. You a follower of Jesus today? Say it with me. Say it like you claim it, you mean it, you're living by it. Ready? I am his. Let's go out and live in the security and comfort that knowing I am his.